Well, good morning, Chinatown Peace Church. Welcome to those who are on Zoom and to, we're a bit of a smaller group that's gathered here this morning in this warm Cathedral of Gods. It's good to have each one of you here with us this morning. And it's especially good to have with us our other intern this uh, Sunday morning, Chan Yang. So I, I really have to say my heart goes out to Chan because he was up almost all night along with all of our worship team and a few others. And so they're amazing. I've heard them, you know, you've heard them already practicing. I know that Chan will be eloquent as ever, Chan. But we're going to pray especially that God will give you the words to speak to us and we will hear God speak through you because what you're going to try to do, I wouldn't want to attempt. <laughs> As a way of focusing us, uh, one of the texts that, I, uh, that uh, Chan has asked us to read or to, to hear is Isaiah 53, the verses 1 to 6, I believe. And it goes like this. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by others a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces he was despised and we held him in low esteem Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The most powerful statement in the First Testament about the one who would come and take all of our, our sin, our guilt, our, our suffering, uh, our illnesses upon himself. And we come and we gather together this morning and we worship in his name from the inside out, which is the title of our series uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. It also applies to the sermon this morning and uh, we will uh, look forward to singing together. So you're welcome to stand or to sit however you would like, but let me just open us in a word of prayer. God, our Father and Creator, it's, uh, yeah, with wonder that we look around under this glorious, just the canopy that we're, we're um, gathering here this morning and say, wow, you are so good. You are so creative. Um, you're beautiful. And what you create is beautiful. And so, Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering as your people. We pray for those who are gathered in their homes uh, and joining us on Zoom. This morning, we pray for those who are away. We pray that you would meet us, that we would encounter you, that you would give us ears to hear, hearts wide open to what you have for us this morning. For we pray it in Jesus' strong, saving name. Amen. Good morning. So the first song is From the Inside Out.
the next song is Yes I Will. song is thinking deep.
So our scripture reading, readers this morning are Rose and Zach. Rose is reading Romans 5, 1 to 5, and Zach is reading Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. So Rose, come on up here, to, and, and the mic's right here. You can read and then Zach. All right, Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in, in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Yeah. Thank you. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The word of the Lord. Yeah, that's kind of a hard word to hear, isn't it? I'm glad that Jesus said later, I am the true vine. But Chan, come on up. I'm going to pray for you. And then you can. And as he comes up, just want to remind you. I will be connecting with the Zoomers um, after, uh, after Chan's message. And with you, two questions. What helped you to hear God speak to you through Chan? So what, what from Chan's message helped you to hear God's word to you? And secondly, the other question is, remember, what would have helped you to hear it even more clearly? So we're going to, first of all, affirm Chan and his message, and then we're going to try to give him also some constructive feedback as well. The first is constructive, too. Okay. Thank you, God, for the opportunity that I've had to work together with Chan over this past year. Thank you for Chan and his whole group from Point Grey Intermennonite Fellowship that have joined together with our young adults. Thank you for keeping us all safe last night and uh, as we went around Stanley Park and... And uh, thank you for, yeah, thanks for the times that we've been able to spend together in this park and, and across the city. And we pray that the lives together would, would just strengthen our walk with you. And now we pray, especially for Chan, he hasn't had a lot of sleep. I pray your spirit would be upon him, that he would sense your joy in him, your pleasure in his life and in his words, and that we would hear from you. Open our ears, open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So, I'm going to quickly set myself a timer so that I know how to pace myself. Can people hear me in the back? Okay. I will try projecting with this volume consistently. The title of my sermon was, What Can Men Do Against Such Reckless Hate? Does anyone realize that quote? Oh, okay. Well, this quote is a direct quote from the movie Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. 
Um, it's said by King Theoden as he is in despair of the invading Uruk forces in Helm's Deep. There's no hope. There's a massive 10,000 army Uruk forces that's destroying human lives as it goes on. And they only can defend the fortress with about a few hundred men and a hundred elves. It's really hopeless. That Peter Jackson movie is actually based on the famous fantasy novel by John Ronald Rule Tolkien, or J.R.R. Tolkien, as he's known. He wrote the books across several years, and he finally released them in 1954 and 1955. And since then, it has become a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, it's been read across by generation as one of the best-selling English novels in history. And I think at least some of us have probably watched the movie, or at least read the books, too. I'm a big fan of his novels. Um, I've read the three Middle Earth books, I've read The Hobbit, I've read The Silmarillion, and some of the other side books that he created. To list the legacy of that Middle Earth saga would simply be too long. Tolkien started writing the book, though, in a much less ideal setting than what we'd imagined. He wrote it in the trenches of World War I. We can learn this from his son, the letter to his son, Christopher Tolkien. Um, he wrote to him that writing came off as a good escape from all the death, destruction, and the depress depressing things that surrounded him. Notably, he served during the Battle of the Somme. Now, if you know your history, the Battle of the Somme is still considered the bloodiest history in human in the bloodiest battle in human history. One million souls, over one million people, died in a span of four months. And you know what the resulting gain of land was that for, the Allied forces? Six kilometers. Now, just to picture six kilometers, some of you know where I live. I live in Marple. Here to Marple is five and a half kilometers. One million boys. There were boys under the age of 17 or 16 that served in World War I. One million of them lay dead on, across six kilometers. That's depressing. For Tolkien, who was surrounded by one of the most tragic events in human history, he had to resort to something to escape from it. The Lord of the Rings actually encapsulates this sort of hopelessness very well. Anybody that knows, the idea that a small hobbit is in charge of taking the Ring of Doom to Mount Doom and destroying it against Sauron just doesn't make any sense. But that's the sort of hopelessness that Tolkien would have felt. But even within this dread, even within this hopelessness, Tolkien ended the book on a very hopeful note. Anybody that remembers the ending can think about how they end up destroying the ring, everyone gets a closure, Aragorn becomes king, and Frodo has to leave his friends, but he still gets to live. How did Tolkien find that hope? Now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk about Isaiah. We read two passages from Isaiah today, and I chose those two for specific reasons. They come from two separate parts of Isaiah. The book is attributed to be written by the prophet himself, and I don't have the I don't have the time to touch on the complication on the authorship because there is a there is a complication. We don't know who actually wrote it. In fact, if it was written by one person or many people. But for simplicity's sake, I will start referring to the writer as Isaiah. Isaiah is largely split between two parts. Chapters 1 to 39 and chapters 40 to 66. They're almost like two different books, the way they read. And the first part is what we're going to talk about first. Chapters 1 to 39. The first part is characterized by many different kinds of judgments, prophecies, warnings, and frustrations against the people of Israel and against God. He warns Israel's rulers of their wrongdoings and how it will bring upon God's judgment. This sort of frustration is clearly expressed in Isaiah chapter 1, the very opening poem of the book. And I'm going to read an excerpt from it. Hear, O heaven, and listen, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up. But they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. 
it's really hard to imagine the frustration that comes from Isaiah just from reading this. So I'm going to picture a different uh, image for you. Imagine you're Dr. Fauci. And imagine you're Dr. Fauci in August 2019. Exactly a year from, from now, in the past. Imagine yourself as Dr. Fauci. And guess what? He knows the coronavirus is coming. He knows this pandemic will come and hurt millions of people and kill hundreds of thousands of people. So what does he do? He naturally tells the Trump administration, Congress, WHO, warn them about an upcoming pandemic. But let's be real. How many people will listen to Dr. Fauci? How many people will listen to this hypothetical person that knows this, there's a pandemic coming, will listen to this man and be prepared? This is what Isaiah was doing to the people of Israel. He was telling them, repent. Go back to God. There's a doom coming. But no one listened. You know how frustrating that is? Knowing that there's going to be hundreds and thousands of people that are dying. But you can stop it. If people listen, if people in power listen, you can stop it. But they don't. That's a different kind of dread than Tolkien was in. Isaiah, Isaiah's frustration is very unique. I think it was Zach who read the Vineyard song for us today. Um, Isaiah chapter 5 is the Vineyard song. Now, I read an excerpt from chapter 1 that was a poem. In chapter 5, Isaiah uses songs to portray his lamentation, portray his frustration. He talks about a vineyard that isn't fruitful and how it gets burned because God's like, it's not producing any fruits. We've got to get rid of it. And the song is really familiar from the story that Jesus tells us on, you know, later on in the New Testament. But this song, this vineyard, is more focused on the bad, the despair, the agony, the anger, instead of the hopeful message that Jesus gave, gave to us later on. Next to the Psalms, Isaiah utilizes some of the most flowery languages in the Old Testament. Lots of poetry, lots of songs, lots of metaphors and similes. And it's beautiful. It really is. Some of them read very well. Like the vineyard song. I really like it. Never mind the content. But from chapters 40 to 66, things take a drastic turn. In fact, it takes such a drastic turn that there's a time skip. Most readers wouldn't be aware if you just read it from 39 to 40, but between those two chapters, there's about a 100 to 200 year time skip between the two. So here's the historical context. Isaiah warns the Israelites time and time again, they're gonna be, there's a doom coming. God will use Assyria, then Babylon, to sack the city of Jerusalem and take all its possessions and its people. About 100 years after Isaiah's death, that exactly happened. And then about 100 years later, the Israelites are freed from their captivity in Babylon and allowed back into the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So chapter 40 starts at the point where the Israelites are already on their way back to Jerusalem. Now think about that. If we attribute it to one writer, how did he know that there's a doom, impending doom coming, but at the end of it all, they'll still be able to come back and rebuild the temple? And this is just my thought here. Even if you're a prophet that knows everything that, and prophesies the future, there's still millions, or maybe hundreds of thousands of people that will die and get hurt in the process. That's so frustrating. But how can you convey this hope when you're writing? I mean, I promised you I wouldn't touch upon the authorship of the book, but here I am going it again. And when Babylon comes, they take everything. They stack the temple. They take the heritage, the cultural riches, their people into captivity. Everything is lost in the process. But then Cyrus the Great comes out and frees the people of Jerusalem and lets them go back to rebuild the temple. But how did Isaiah know this? We read part of that good news today in Isaiah chapter 53. Chapter 53 is one of the four or five servant songs in the book of Isaiah. The servant songs are a collection of poems and songs that tell a story of an lowly being that's basically nothing 
comes to save the people and then dies for their sins. Now, thousands of years later, in our rear view mirror, we, can, we know what this means. We know what that is. But how did Isaiah know? And Isaiah uses poetry, allegorical stories, and songs to tell these things. And, in fact, many of these aren't just cut and dry stories like we get from the first five books, like in Moses, from Moses. It's really easy to dismiss biblical writers, people in those times, simply as superheroes or prophets that talked to God and were super confident in what they said. Let's talk about Isaiah. Yeah, maybe he did see 200 years into the future and saw that the Israelites would come back to Jerusalem. But even these people felt the anger, the frustration, the despair, the uncertainty that we do. And that is clearly expressed in the first half of Isaiah. The first part of Isaiah, rather. And there's another example, King David. King David is a fascinating figure in the Old Testament. He messed up so many times. He may probably did committed some of the worst sins you could ever think of. But at the same time, he had direct communication with God. He knew that it was bad. But he did it anyways. That's how we are. That's how we are as humans. Even if we have direct communication with God, we get frustrated. We get uncertain. We don't know. Even if we kind of do. So let's go back to the Dr. Fauci example. Let's let's say Fauci, knowing what happens in the past, or in the future rather, and he's in August 2019, but he writes a book. He writes a book, and he talks, and it, and the book predicts 100 years into the future, saying that because of the because of COVID-19, everything will be better. We'll have a better public health system. The WHO will be prepared. There will never be another pandemic, and all of us will be prepared if there is another pandemic to be socially distant and defend ourselves. But how would Dr. Fauci be so sure that 200, 100 years into the future, that we're all going to be fine? How can he be so sure to publish that, put, him out, put himself out there, be like, we're going to be okay? How can anybody find that sort of hope? And this is where I first started my meditation. I'm a pessimistic person by nature. In fact, I call myself a career pessimist. It's really hard to see the glass half full. But Tolkien, which I'm a big fan of, and Isaiah, which I really like, both were in impossible situations. Isaiah had to go through a collapse of a civilization. Tolkien lived through the worst war in human history. Both of these people were surrounded by so much hate, yet they found peace and, ha and hope and pass, and even better, they pass it on to us, the future generation. There has to be a secret there. So, and this, this is where more of my personal opinion starts to come in. God did speak to them. Yes, we, we, can, we can attribute that to all the Old, Old Testament writers. But I also say that there's the same frustration in them as in it were us. So how did they go over that uncertainty? How did they go past the uncertain, the depressing, the hate, and come to a hopeful conclusion? The answer is boring, but it's, I think it's faith. But I'm going to elaborate on that just a bit and my take on it. I think faith is the act of taking the intangible and making it tangible. Faith is taking the abstract and making it practical. Faith is taking what is internal and making it real. I'm going to repeat that. Faith is the act of taking the intangible and making it tangible. Faith is the act of taking something that's abstract and making it practical. Faith is taking what is internal and making it real. 
I'm going to use scripture as an example. Scripture, just like any other form of literature, is a way in which we take the difficult and abstract understandings of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, and making it real for us. How does that happen? How does this process of something that's abstract becomes real, intangible becomes tangible, and making it practical? I want to go back to Isaiah and Tolkien and, and connect the two. Actually, before that, I'll actually tell my, my own part. If I have personal frustration, anger, hurt, depression, if I don't tell that to my friends, my family, my church, is that real? If I just keep it within myself, it's I only know it and my God. How real is that? But as soon as I share it, as soon as I utter a word, as soon as I tell someone, hey, I need help, that feeling, that emotion becomes real. It becomes real. So the real take the process of making something real is taking something that's internal and making it externally available. Tangible. To make it tangible, you have you have to part of the five senses. You have to be able to see it, you have to feel it, you have to hear it. But that's what Isaiah did. That's what Tolkien did. They had their lessons, they had their despair, they had their frustrations. So they wrote wrote it down on paper. They wrote songs, they wrote ballads, they wrote all these things to pass down, and they made it tangible. How, how is a text tangible? Well, you can read it, you can touch it. How is a song tangible? You can hear it, you can sing it. Now, I'm only using literature as an example, but this works for any other form of creative process. If you create furniture and that's your way of expressing yourself creatively, that becomes tangible. If you paint, if you draw, that also works. And finally, practical. How are these things practical? Going back to my personal example, if I have some frustration or hurt and I share it with my wife, Stephanie, and she takes it in, and we both try to resolve it, if we resolve that hurt, then it's practical. We solve something. Then let's go back to the Tolkien example. How did he make his form of literature practical? It offers us his vision, his lessons, his thoughts in a form of literature to us. It sold for millions of copies through generations. It has affected everyone's lives. For example, mine. I read through the Lord of the Rings at least twice in high school. That has affected, that has affected me in reality. It changed my reality. Practical means that it's changing our own reality. The Bible has changed our reality. Isaiah has changed their reality by writing it down and passing it upon generations. This is the act of faith. You're taking something that's internal, your relationship with God, you're, you're listening to the Holy Spirit and making it external, and then you make it tangible so that people can share it. And finally, the practical. Once it's shared, it can change our reality, whether it's literature or straight out text. And I... And I Going back to my own story, and this is a more positive spin on it. One of the most memorable things that we have are stories. In fact, this is no diss to Pastor Tim or any pastors, but I, I can tell you for sure, I can't remember the sermon from last year from my church. I cannot. But you know what I do remember? Stories and memories from camp. Stories and memories after the service. Maybe after the service, I had a really good conversation with one of my brothers at church. This is a good example of why both Isaiah and Tolkien use stories, use literature, use imagination to express their vision, their hurt, their anger, and what they learn from those anger and hurt. It's what we remember. One of the weirdest things about memories is that I remember, and Stephanie's not here, I remember my first kiss. And it was in, it was in middle school, it was in a dance. I remember the song, but I don't remember anything before or after. I just remember that moment. But it still affects me today. It's a really nice memory. It's a good memory.
But that's how our memories work. We like to remember stories and events. And that's what changes our reality. That's what affects us to this day. So just like how faith is the process of changing something that's internal into external, into tan intangible to tangible, and something that is abstract into practical, so is art. Isaiah and Tolkien both wrote during a time of utter dread. In fact, I can't even imagine what they had to go through. It's more than what I probably have to go through in my lifetime. But they utilized art to process hope, to find something. Anybody who has completed anything in a creative process knows that inspiration is real. When you sit there and you're trying to write something, at one point the inspiration hits and it writes itself. Or you're drawing something. Or you're painting a room. But as soon as they started writing and they listened to that inspiration, they listened to the Holy Spirit, they listened to God, they found the inner peace and hope that they could pass on for generations on. Inspiration comes so easily during the creative process. Inspiration is one of those things that comes when I'm trying to write this sermon. You just sit there and it hits you like a truck. You learn things about yourself in the creative process that you never knew. In fact, I think it's the process of detaching yourself from your own ego. As soon as you put your words into a tangible, readable paper, you detach yourself from it. But maybe this is what Tolkien and Isaiah were reaching for. They needed to detach themselves from all this pent up frustration, anger, death, dread. I mean, Tolkien wrote a beautiful fantasy story that's being retold for generations. Isaiah sang of a lowly servant that would lead God's people to salvation, but through his own sacrifice. But both stories tell of a terrible event that are resolved by the least of these. And writing, just like any other form of art, is a great ther can be a, a, a great form of self-therapy method. But I'm saying it's beyond that. I'm saying it's, a, it's probably an essential, if not a good, way to interact with God, to interact with our Maker. I asked this question in the beginning. What can men do against such reckless hate? But maybe the only thing we can do against such reckless hate it's simply be still and listen to our God and listen. But not just listen, just, you know, being there. Listen actively because that's the part of the creative process. Anybody who wanted to create anything, you have to be there, not just waiting for inspiration. You have to be actively listening for inspiration. inspiration. Tolkien changed our reality through his timeless story. His imagination created a fantasy world where we could visit and learn the lessons he experienced during the terrible sitting that he was. Isaiah did the exact same thing. And I only use literature as my example for the two writers, but this applies for any creative process, whether you're making Ikea furniture, making you know, art for Instagram musicians, or painting that wall for the third time in two weeks. That is all a creative process. And in that creative process, I think we always find God. We always find peace. I want to touch upon the Roman uh, chapter that we read today. And if people can turn to it, that'll be great. But I'll read it again. And this is from, uh, I forgot which translation it was, but I don't think it was the translation that we used. And it says, but well, we also boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. This passage, I'm going to be very honest with you, I don't like it. But I put it in there because it puts, encapsulates it in a big picture manner of how we get to hope. But when you're depressed, when you're frustrated, when you're in that deep pit, this doesn't make any sense. Because all you see is that endless darkness. And I think at least somebody who's experienced some sort of depression, is that when any, any sort of advice or any sort of, you know, the Romans passage comes, he just goes out the other ear. But what Isaiah and Tolkien did is that they put this in practice. They wrote. They committed it to the creative process. 
they went through the suffering. They went and produced endurance, and that endurance produced their character and produced hope. The Romans passage is too simple, but I feel like Tolkien and Isaiah served as a great example, a practical example, on how they dealt with hate and despair, personally. I would encourage everyone to create. Our maker is a creator. We were made in his image. And it doesn't matter what you create. But through the creative process, we experience God and hope in ways that are new, in ways that are practical, tangible, and real. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we went, I went back for that too. Thank you so much, Chan, for speaking God's word to us. I'm going to just hook up to the headphones so that we can have response as well from the people on Zoom. Wow, I was reminded again what a gift God gives me uh, that I get to work with these young people as a pastor, these interns and, and youth young people who are far more gifted than I'll ever be and uh, watch them grow and develop. I'm going to have to actually put this on here. No worries. Okay. Thanks. I'll just do that. So, yeah, um, I realized as I got to the end of the, your sermon, I, I have to have some creative, constructive points for you, Chen. But first of all, let's start with, um, can you hear me on Zoom? Yes. Thank you, Nelson. Okay, so whether you're yes. meeting us online, thanks so much, or whether you're here, um, any words of uh, how did you hear, uh, or what did you hear God say to you through Chan's message this morning? Okay, I'll get in line with the camera. In a creative way. Okay. So it, the, the whole thing was very creative. Okay, so Alice especially appreciated this wonderfully creative redefining of faith as the abstract becoming practical, the intangible becoming tangible, and the internal becoming outward and real. I love that too. I thought too that was a great way to talk about what faith is and, and kind of give us a, a grip on faith. And then it also leads us to why creativity is so important. And I thought one of the things that I would say is, you know your audience. We, we've got a ton of creative people right here. Um, I, I always marvel at how many creative people there are as part of this little community. And so, yeah, you are speaking, I'll say their language because I'm not particularly creative. Okay. Great. Anybody else? Thank you, Rose. Hope, yeah. So we went from hope. What's the answer to hope? Faith. Uh, how does how does the hope become a reality through this actual reality of faith? Right. Yeah. So I, I love the these key Christian words. Sometimes we talk about these words like hope and faith being a suitcase. They kind of they're, they're a word that packs all the stories in them. The only way that hope or faith have any meaning at all is the stories that go into that suitcase of hope or the suitcase of faith. So yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we we liked how how uh, Chan brought himself into it, right? That was very personable. You communicate. We we believe you because you believe what you're speaking, and then you also spoke very naturally about yourself and brought yourself into that, and and that that really connected us to your message. Yeah, good, Sandra. Yeah. Okay. Great. Sandra liked how, how Chan connected the present with the past, like Tolkien, with the deep past, the stories of Isaiah, and even showing how Isaiah's history be, kind of came forward in, first of all, second Isaiah, or Isaiah versus chapters uh, 40 through 66, and then Jesus coming as the fulfillment of the great servant song. So, yeah, that wonderful kind of carrying along. Last week, Ray had a, 
had an amazing sermon for us. And uh, one of the things we did say is he told such great stories to illustrate what he was talking about. We said he could maybe even use some Bible stories because we often don't know a lot of the Bible stories. And then you brought in David. So that was a, you know, I, I like that. I like when we also hear examples from the biblical text as well. And you did that. Yes. Yes. In only a few words, we got a good introduction to Isaiah, didn't we? Yeah, I felt that you, you had done that very well as well. Thank you, Alex. So Alex said he found it breathtaking with so many layers and is looking forward to unpacking or, or coming back to this message again with, with the community. So great. Thank you. Any of Chan's peers want to give him some uh, a, a response? How did you hear God's word this morning? Okay. Any, okay, let's just shift to the second one. Um, as uh, the ice cream truck serenades us. Uh, yeah, what might have helped you? This is for Chan's sake again, as <clears throat> uh, one who's, who's learning what it means to communicate as well. What might have helped you to hear God's word more clearly from Chan? Uh, <laughs> yeah, had Chan not needed to wear a mask. And I, I know it's our jaws move and it pulls it off of our noses. And it's, I saw you do that and I felt for you because as everyone knows, I do that all the time as well. So this is where I make my plug. But this was originally a two-part thing that I had to split because when I originally wrote it for our church, it was too long. So I split it into two parts. Okay. The first part is focusing on how we can make faith personal. There is the personal faith and there's the communal faith, I think. The communal faith process is exactly the same in my opinion. When we come together as a church, when we come together as a community, and we do God's actions within our faith, it also becomes practical. It becomes real and it becomes tangible the same way. So, um, yeah, there's, this is basically how, you, how we can, I guess, go over our personal publication. And there's the other aspect, how the church and how the community feel over and there's a few other examples that I have that is a bit long winded so yeah mm. so that's I hope that answers the question that's great okay yeah great I really like how you connected community with communication the two belong together right those two words um, community or communication is what we do for the sake of community and that happens through the creative process okay great any others for uh, for Chan Anybody are you online here? Yeah, I, you know, at first I thought maybe just uh, helping us understand a little more the link between faith and creativity. Of course, you did it with those those three um, uh, pairings off. I think that that at first I went back and went, wait a minute, okay, creativity. How is that faith, and how does that lead us to hope? Um, and, I, and perhaps another example in there, you did it, I, and I went back and I realized it's just a lot coming at us. And so that would have been one thing. Um, maybe one other thing I might suggest, the word detach kind of, first of all, caught me uh, um, or maybe took me a uh, different path. For me, when you're detached, you're kind of unemotionally, you step back, you're relationally detached. You said what we should detach from our hopelessness or from our pessimism, which is a kind of a, you know, maybe that is actually good to use a word in a context that, or in a way that we don't normally use it. I would have maybe said laying down or, or finding a way to put, put aside our hopelessness. So those are a couple little things. I had to look for some way to, to give you constructive feedback. Um, Anybody else have something you want to say to Chan? Thank you for all the good things that you've, you've given to him. It, was, it, it really was a joy to be here together and to have you share with us. And you're still an intern, so maybe part two will come up someday soon, right? Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for um, responding to God's word and to Chan. Let's uh, we'll ask Emily to come on up and the music team, and uh, we'll respond. <clears throat> in worship. Great are you, Lord.
Oh, it's in there somewhere. Do you want me to, I'll take my stuff off, and you might have to move that around. Okay, please stand for the sending blessing.
We are in Ephesians, so I'm going to go back to Ephesians and Paul's wonderful sending blessing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or imagine, according to his powers that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout every generation, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to do immeasurably more.